Hello friends, in the last few episodes I've shown you how I salvaged motors from washing machines and windshield wipers. I then tried to explain to you how these motors work and the next step was to build something based on these parts. The first idea was a drivetrain intended for a robot powered by two washing machine motors. And the next idea were linear actuators powered by windshield wiper motors. And in this episode, I'm now trying to combine the two ideas, build a second robotic drivetrain, more complex than the first one, powered and steered by windshield wiper motors. So let me show you footage of the building process and of the first tests of the new drivetrain. And after that, I will go into some of the technical details. So in the meanwhile, I have bought 10 of these old windshield wiper motors for five to 10 euros each on eBay. And we actually have to begin with a slight modification of these motors themselves. Now, just a reminder here, we find two wires on the back side of the gearbox. These lead to little switches or wiper contacts on the back side of the warm gear. You don't need them if you don't use the motors as actual windshield wipers. You can forget about them for now. Then we have uh, three more wires and the brown one here is connected to one of the brushes and to the enclosure of the motor and that's where the problem lies. The two other wires are connected to two more motor brushes and we said in the last video that the third motor brush is actually used so that the motor can be driven at another, in this case a slower speed. So we will only need the two ordinary brushes but since we actually have eight motors that are electrically connected together by their enclosures, if we want or not, we will run into problems once we want to reverse the polarity across these motors by using H bridges that are controlled by microcontrollers. And that is why I'm now disconnecting the electrical path between one of the brushes and the housings of these motors. And here you can see that one of the brushes is electrically connected to the enclosure via a little piece of brass and I'm cutting that off with a side cutter. So now this wire here is basically dangling freely inside the enclosure and in order to prevent future contact to the enclosure I take some MS polymer in order to glue that in place. And I did this as the first thing here because this glue actually needs some time to harden. It can take days depending on the circumstances. And in case you don't understand why this is even necessary, just you wait. I'll explain it in detail to you after I have completed the build here later in this video. So with that being taken care of, we can now tackle a whole number of mechanical and other practical issues. And the first thing was to find wheels. Now these are the types of wheels that I used for my first robotic drivetrain. This time I bought some that are a little smaller. They are around 20 centimeters in diameter and I bought them for around 5 euros a piece at a local home improvement store. Of course you can find these things online these days as well though. Now again the rims of these wheels here are held together by four bolts and I recommend you to look for those rather than the ones that are welded together. You'll see why. It's just more practical. And now I measure the inner diameter. That's 16 millimeters. And that means that we can just take a piece of standard stainless steel 16 millimeter round bar stock as our axle. You know, it will connect the wheels to our suspension. But these types of wheels were never intended to drive anything actively. And that's why we have to weld something to these rims. But as you can see here by the scratches in the surface, this material here is galvanized or zinc plated and we will have to remove some of that zinc from the surface to weld steel on here. Also this bearing here kind of protrudes from the sides and we will have to grind off a little bit of that to even that out. And I'm doing that here with my angle grinder and you should be aware that if you want to weld steel parts that are galvanized, you have to remove the zinc. But heating up the zinc creates zinc oxide and that is toxic. When welding or even when grinding it, you should protect yourself and go for good ventilation and wear a protective mask. With that being done, the next step is now to make a little connector piece that will connect the rims to the windshield wiper motor. And for that, I have now bought these sections of round bar stock here. 
you could buy some 35 millimeter bar stock and try to cut these yourself but well luckily these days at least in germany you can buy little well discs of this type that are already cut for just a couple of euros and that's what i did and here you can see that i want to place them directly on the rims but before welding that on there, a lot of modifications have to be made. The first thing is that the center of all of the discs has to be found. And for that, I recently bought this center finder here. And I'm scratching a steel scriber alongside the tool in order to approximate where that actual center is. After having done that, I mark that spot. And now it would actually be time to properly drill a hole through the center with a lathe. Now I have a lathe, but it's not operational yet. Well, we'll have to change that soon, I think. But well, for now I will have to do it with the drill press. And well, making even a small mistake here could turn out to be fatal later on. So it's better if you buy more of these discs than you actually need, just in case you screw up a couple of times. And I'm drilling a 7.5 millimeter hole here. And into that hole, we will insert a section of this M8 screw here, of which we will have to cut off a piece, in this case, five centimeters. And after grinding off the edges, I'm now using my vise in order to force this little screw here into the connector piece. And well, it's really tough because it's an M8 screw and a 7.5 millimeter hole. So the M8 screw is actually a little too wide to fit inside, but this will ensure that the bolt is sitting really tight inside the steel disc. And after turning the piece upside down, it would now be time to TIG weld these two pieces together here on the back side, which I did off camera. The next thing that we need now, already known from the last video, is the 30 millimeter M8 connector nut. We mark it with a center punch. Then we screw it onto the shaft coming out of the gearbox of the windshield wiper motor. Now we need the drill press and use it in order to drill a three millimeter hole through both the nut and the shaft sitting inside of it. And this is what the end result should look like. We have a three millimeter hole on both sides of the connector nut to fasten the M8 screw and the shaft likewise inside. You can then weld the connector nut quickly and precisely on both sides so that these little tiny screws will not really have to bear the torque generated by the motor. But while you're still working on all this and have to align things and add things and so on, use these kinds of screws because then the process is still reversible and you can take the parts apart again to correct certain things. And now the connector piece and the rim can finally be welded together. In this case, by just a few tag welds, I think they will be stable enough to handle the kinds of torques that we'll have here. And this is really all we need to transfer the rotation from one of the motors to one of these wheels here. But of course, this little connector piece is too flimsy and too wiggly, as you can see here, to act as a suspension. It really should only convey a rotational movement onto the wheels, while we have to build an actual suspension that will be inserted from the outside into the wheels. And that is what I'm going to build now. And you might wonder why I left so much space here between those two parts. And that is because this is where I will insert an encoder disc as part of a rotary encoder that will allow us to essentially turn the windshield wiper motor into a servo motor where we can measure the motor speed and control it in a feedback loop. But more about this later on. In order to build the suspension, we now need 20 millimeter square steel tubes and again pieces of our 16 millimeter stainless steel round bar stock. We cut off section of both of those. Then we cut 60 millimeter holes into some of the square tube sections and we insert the sections of bar stock. And then we weld that together so that we get a piece shaped like this one here. The next thing that we need now are these 70 millimeter flat steel stock parts here. And we again drill a couple of holes and this is where we will install the motor itself. And now these two parts are joined. And maybe you can now already see where I'm going with this. It will allow us to suspend these wheels, but also steer. And of course, all that you have seen so far is repeated three times so that I end up with four identical units. 
Now I built a central frame made from more 20 millimeter square tube and I've already cut off sections of the tube and I'm welding it together. Now I've inserted the four units and you can already kind of see where I'm going with this. But what is still missing are the steering motors and that is what I'm installing now. But as a quite important intermediate step, these stainless steel washers here are added to each of the four units. The outer diameter is 50 millimeters and the inner one 16.5. Here is where another set of encoder discs will be installed in order to operate these steering mechanisms also in a feedback loop so that we can measure the steering angle of each individual wheel and transfer that information to a microcontroller. But the actual encoder disc that is made of plastic will only be added once all the dirty work and welding is done. And here you can see how another set of four identical windshield wiper motors is now installed onto these axles as steering motors, again using 30 millimeter connector nuts and parts made from 70 millimeter flat steel. And after many hours of aligning and correctly centering all these parts here, I then finally weld both ends of the connector nuts to the motor shaft and the steering axle, locking everything in place. So I should probably deliver some commentary concerning this footage here. Well, first of all, this is just a guy carrying 16 wires around with him in a couple of batteries, connecting the individual motors to these voltage sources in order to somewhat demonstrate the capabilities of this drivetrain. There are no H-bridges installed, 
there are no feedback loops, there are no microcontrollers. This is just a guy manually activating and deactivating motors. So that's why everything here is still a little, well, less than perfect. But I think it's good enough uh, for you to understand what this thing could do once all that is installed. Now, let's talk about different steering methods. First of all, people are wondering why four wheels, why four wheel drive, why eight motors? That's very complex, very complicated. Why are you doing that? Well, my long term goal is to build robots that can handle different terrains and off road landscapes, or for example, climbing up stairs and stuff like that. So I want to learn to control as many actuators as possible in as many ways as possible. So I need to challenge myself here a little bit. And, you know, just building a robot with two motors and differential steering. Uh, it's just not gonna cut it. So the first method that probably comes to mind when it comes to steering a four wheel vehicle is probably Ackerman steering as used in cars. And the thing with that is that when using Ackerman steering, you have four different turning radii or circles and two different steering angles. That means that all of these four wheels are basically rotating at a different angular velocity. So what you would have to do is to keep two of the steering wheels just in parallel with the frame here, then steer with two of the others with two different angles and then drive the four motors at four different speeds. And that wouldn't be really a problem if you have microcontrollers that can read out the angular velocities via rotary encoders on the wheels, which I'm installing, and then giving back a pulse width modulation to these motors so that you have proper regulation of the motor speed. So it is possible to do Ackerman steering and four wheel drive without differential gears if you have individual motors and feedback loops for all four wheels. You could then improve on Ackerman steering if you also involve the other two steering motors, and I'm trying to hint at that while arranging the motors here during the construction process. And that would look like something like this, where you would still have basically only two steering angles and now only two turning radii, one inner and one outer radius. And that would mean also only two different angular velocities and the most important thing of course the turning radii themselves are just much smaller than with Ackerman steering. So if you wanted to employ this method here and use the capabilities that we have at hand you could turn in much smaller circles. But I actually don't really see a reason to employ this steering method here with the different angular velocities at all at least not when you're driving indoors and that is what this particular robot I think is supposed to do. So let me explain with these sketches here that I just really slapped together in five minutes to explain what I want to do here. So the robot starts by just driving a straight line as far as that makes sense. It then stops and then all four steering wheels are rearranged. I'm doing this here in a succession because I'm manually connecting the motors to a voltage source. But, well, proper computer controlled age bridges could do that simultaneously. Okay, that's just because of my crude testing method here. Then the robot can again drive in any given direction in a straight line to then again stop. And if necessary, when it has reached basically um, its destination, it could then turn around its own axis if necessary. Well, let's say you have a camera mounted on one side of the robot and you want that camera to point in a certain direction. Then you could use the ability to turn around your own axis. The same with a manipulator arm or anything else. So it's really hard to do this manually, but I think you get the idea. Something else that is also, I think, superior to turning in radii or circles when you're in a building is the ability to just drive around corners in a 90 degree angle. Let's say you have a narrow corridor and the robot is driving a straight line into a corner. It could then just turn around its own axis, then rearrange the wheels with a frame and go on driving a straight line like before. So in other words, it really is a complex system, but it also has a lot of capabilities. And I think it will be exciting to program this. Well, 
Another thing that makes this more interesting are the possibilities of feedback loops that I've been talking about a couple of times in this video. But I just don't have the time right now to explain all that. I think we will have to make a video especially about rotary encoders, both like the commercial ones as well as the ones that I made here myself. So let's talk about that another time. But there's one more thing that I have prepared that I wanted to explain to you. One common problem that you will stumble upon when you want to reuse automotive type 12 volt motors like these windshield wiper motors. And it has to do with me in the beginning of the video disconnecting this brass part here inside one of the wiper motors. And let me explain that why I had to do that. Okay, so when you want to control a motor with a PWM and be able to reverse its polarity, you typically use H bridges. The H bridges that I want to use for this project are these here. You can get them on eBay for under seven euros. They come from China and take a long time to ship. But Vmax 27 volts and 43 amps maximum current, you can't beat that for that price. And I already ordered 10 or so of them. Now, what's the issue here? When you want to control a motor with an H bridge, it's typically very simple. You have your voltage source, you have your motor, and then you have an H bridge consisting of four switching elements. One special thing though with windshield wiper motors, one of their poles is already connected to the enclosure internally. Just keep that in mind for later, it's going to be important. In this drawing here, as normal in electrical engineering, you draw switches. But these switches can represent any kind of switching element, be it a bipolar transistor, MOSFET, IGBT, or even a technology that isn't invented yet. So what you do is that you can, for example, close these two switches here, and then the current will flow in this direction through the motor, resulting in a specific rotational direction, as indicated by this arrow here. When you now switch those switches off and instead connect the two others, the direction of the current through the motor reverses and so does the rotational direction. And one special thing now with many automotive components is that one of their poles is also connected to the enclosure. Now as long as you just have one motor or one actuator, that is not a problem at all. But once you have more than one, let's say two or in our case eight, then these motors are electrically connected also via their enclosures because they are mounted on the same metal frame here. And that is a problem and let me explain to you why. As soon as you power up two or more motors simultaneously but at reverse polarity, you will just create a short circuit. And that will destroy your switching elements, be it MOSFETs, bipolar transistors, whatever. So this will essentially destroy your edge bridges because you have a current path here that you don't really want. And that is the reason why I opened the enclosures of the motors and really just deleted the electrical connection between one of the brushes and the enclosure. But if you don't feel good with having the enclosures on no clearly defined potential, you can still just connect them to the minus pole, for example, of your voltage source after that. So the technical part of this video really ends here, but I'm going to talk a little more about the bigger picture now. But for now, I want to ask you that in case you can spare a buck or two to become a supporter of this channel on patreon.com slash tpai, where I also post some update pictures and texts every other day. But I also do that on my Facebook page and just look for the post apocalyptic inventor on Facebook links to Patreon and Facebook also in the video description. I also used to upload well little update videos in the past. I've been thinking about doing that on Facebook now or on Vidme. I'm not sure yet if I'm going to do that. But make sure to visit me on Facebook and Vidme links in the video description. Next thing is that I just wanted to talk about this video and the channel in general. And that is that, as you can see in this video, I first showed the visually appealing part, uh, showed some action maybe for the people that don't have so much time on their hands or just don't have that long of an attention span. And after that, then I went into the details and the technicalities. And that is how I will keep this in the future as well. And here I am at a part where I will just ramble on a little bit about the problems that I face making these videos. And as you can imagine, it is really hard. 
Robotics involves mechanical engineering, electrical engineering and computer science. To be more precise, electromechanics like in this video, power electronics as is needed when you use all these age bridges for example and pulse width modulation to control these motors and as I said I want to do that in feedback loops so we're also talking about electronic control and regulation. A real robot also needs sensory data to know about its surroundings and that's something else entirely again. Remote control and wireless will also be an issue because before you can have any kind of autonomy in a system like this you have to control it remotely or otherwise you're forced to walk around with a bunch of wires in your hands as I did in this video. Microcontroller programming is again a topic that is quite separate from all the other things here well not from electronic control and regulation but it requires again other skills than for example analog electronic regulation of stuff. And after all that you can talk about big things like autonomy and even artificial intelligence but that's of course a whole nother ball game. Now, as you can imagine there are not a lot of people in this world who are capable of working in all these fields and it's one hell of a challenge I'm telling you that. So we have to do this step by step. One video about electromechanics, one video about power electronics and so on and so on. So this will take time. These kinds of videos are incredibly hard to make. I think over 100 hours at least have uh, went into this video. So how will it go on? Well, I would be happy to tell you that the next video will be about the robot again and that there will be quick progress, but there are too many things to take care of. For one, the uh, drill press broke during really the last strokes uh, for this project. I have drilled hundreds of holes and while drilling like the last three or four holes the drill press died a key inside the machine broke but it also damaged the keyway that it slides through typically and that part of the machine is now just damaged it's maybe just scratches inside but it might be bent at this moment i don't know if i can repair the drill press it seems to be a bigger problem then you have seen in the intro of this video that I was working on welding machines and the footage there is like two years old. I never finished it because I moved here. I moved to a new location and couldn't handle that before. But now when I stay on this path and I really want to, I have to, you know, up my metalworking game and that means that the welding machines have to be brought into operation. The same is true for the lathe. You have seen the tailstock earlier in the video I've bought a chuck for that and I really want to get the lathe running because making rotating parts as used in robotics is incredibly hard without a lathe and you can make so many mistakes um, it's so easy to get off balance and screw the alignment if you're just working with tools as imprecise as an angle grinder or even a drill press. So just that you know it, I could use a little more help with this. So please think about becoming a patron. And as always, I hope that you liked this and see you soon.